This is a man with the initials H.M., and because of severe epilepsy, neurosurgeons in the 1950s removed the parts of the brain that they thought were causing the seizures, and this included a structure underneath the temporal lobe on both sides called the hippocampus. Here we see the brain, the underside of the brain, and this would be the temporal cortex, the bottom of the temporal cortex here and here. And here we see a cross-section of the brain, the underlying hippocampus is here and here. On the right, we see the brain tissue, approximately, that was removed from HM's brain. The result of this, er, this uh, uh, operation left him with a profound memory impairment. He was unable to make new episodic memories, and as a consequence, couldn't make new semantic memories either. He did have retrieval for more remote semantic memories, and there was a gradient of memory performance just before the injury. The obvious inference then was that the hippocampus and other structures that were removed in the surgery were cr critical for making new memories, new long-term memories. And so we're going to quickly go through a, a, a story about what the brain is doing when we encode information or acquire information, store it, and then later retrieve it. We'll be looking at the system level that uh, memory operates over multiple brain regions. We'll introduce the concept of allocation. Certain neurons will be responsible for making memories and plasticity. The actual memory itself is the result of changes in the strengths of connections between neurons. So let's again focus on the hippocampus. Here we see the hippocampus, and this is a real brain, and a cross-section showing the hippocampus here, and here the cells have been stained with a purple uh, dye. Now the hippocampus turned out to be a key brain structure for memory because it receives information from all of the major uh, sensory perceptual regions of the brain. And so as a consequence then the hippocampus stands in good position to link together the different aspects of an experience. And scientists, scientists call this encoding. And so when our brain is processing some learning episode, uh, the different areas of the brain are determining what is out there in the visual world, what's happening in the auditory world, what's happening at the uh, surface of the skin. And these areas of the brain then are encoding the learning event. Due to the connectivity of the brain, these perceptual areas are going to send signals down into the hippocampus. And here again we have the convergence. In the hippocampus, neurons in the hippocampus will be activated by that particular learning experience. And those hippocampal neurons will be involved in making a memory trace that links the various sensory aspects of the event. In the remainder of the lesson, we're going to uh, consider individual neurons in different regions of the brain, including the cortex and the hippocampus. So the little circles are neurons. And again, when we encode the information, certain neurons in the perceptual regions will be activated and will be assigned to store the memory of that learning event. And this process is called allocation, that a subset of neurons in the regions processing the information will be activated and will also become part of the memory for that event. Here we see the convergence. Uh, the uh, areas of the brain processing the event are going to send information down into the hippocampus and activate just a certain set of hippocampal neurons. Again, this is an allocation event. So before learning, and then the learning happens, only these cells, the green cells in the hippocampus, are going to respond to that particular learning event, and that is called allocation. So uh, immediately after the learning event, then, what we have, then, is a set of neurons in the cortex and in the hippocampus that responded to the learning event and are going to be assigned to store a memory of that learning event. In the hippocampus, what happens uh, to those neurons that were activated, they are going to strengthen their connections with each other, and this is called plasticity. If we see these hippocampal neurons here, the green, red, and the blue one here, prior to learning, we have a certain strength of synaptic communication between those neurons. After learning, indicated by the larger axon terminals here, we have strengthened synapses, and this is plasticity. 
Now at the level of the synapse, here we see an axon terminal and the neurotransmitters are released into the space. They hook up to these protein channels, open the channels, and positively charged ions enter. That's the electrical signal. Now if this were the synapse prior to learning, after learning, what evidently happens is that the spine inserts extra receptor channels, extra protein channels in the spine membrane so that for a given amount of neurotransmitter there will be a larger electrical signal and this is a short-term effect and this happens immediately after learning. Over the course of hours and days the target cell is going to build proteins and grow the spine so it has a larger surface area able to hold more of these protein channels and as such the synapse will be strengthened over the long term. So this is thought to be the basis for long-term memories. So the idea is then that a learning event can cause the growth of synapses. Not only can a particular synapse increase in strength, but new synapses can be formed. The, axon, the axons can uh, grow new terminals to make new synapses on the target cell. Uh, this process is sort of like an allocation process because only the activated inputs that take part in firing the target neuron are going to be strengthened. So this is the only active input. Neurotransmitters are being released, so this is the only synapse that will be strengthened. These other synapses were not involved in firing the target cell for that learning event, and so they don't get strengthened. Donald Hebb, a, a famous uh, psychologist in the, in the 50s, uh, sort of coined a phrase, cells that fire together wire together. Now at this point then, after the immediate learning event, we have a, a hippocampal memory trace and we've got these other memory traces in the cortex. We're going to make a distinction. The hippocampal memory trace is a strong memory trace. The hippocampal neurons are very good at doing this plasticity thing. They will grow and strengthen connections as a result of just one learning event. But the cortical memory traces are weak. Nevertheless, we can think of the hippocampal memory trace as an index, as a pointer. It is connected to the cortical memory traces. So it's sort of the, the, the memory trace that is binding together the separated memory traces in the cortex. Uh, and we should re remember then that because these uh, uh, cortical memory traces are weak at this point, we're going to need the hippocampal memory trace to retrieve the memory soon after learning. Now, what does retrieval look like? Well, a, a retrieval cue will be processed by the brain. In this case, it's an auditory retrieval cue, so only the auditory cortex neurons are going to be processing the cue. Notice the visual neurons are present, but they're not activated by the cue because the cue came in the auditory channel. And uh, these would be the same neurons that would have been activated at the original learning experience. Well, they're going to uh, reactivate the same hippocampal neuron that is part of the hippocampal memory trace. So when the green neuron is activated in the hippocampus, because of strong connectivity to the others, it will reactivate the rest of those neurons. And that's called pattern completion. So now we have the entire hippocampal memory trace activated. And now the activated hippocampal memory trace will send signals back to the cortex to reactivate the cortical memory traces. Notice the direction of flow of the arrows now is from hippocampus back to cortex. Whereas in the learning event originally, it was the opposite. It was cortical neurons sending activity down into the hippocampus. So when we learn, the flow is from the cortex to the hippocampus. But when we're retrieving, the flow is uh, in the opposite direction. The hippocampal memory trace is being used to reactivate the cortical memory traces. And when the uh, cortical memory traces are activated, they will send uh, information up into the working memory system, and this is when we will experience the retrieval of the memory. But still, after one learning episode, we have the problem of weak cortical memory traces. Fortunately for us, when we go to sleep, our brain reactivates uh, recently learned information. So hippocampal memory traces that were formed during the day will be reactivated, and as such, they're going to be used to strengthen the cortical memory traces. So while we are unconscious, the brain is processing memories. Recent memories are being reactivated so as to strengthen the cortical memory traces. 
The result of this process called system consolidation is that while we start off with weak cortical memory traces, we will strengthen those cortical memory traces over time. As the brain undergoes more and more system consolidation, we strengthen the cortical memory traces. The result of that then would be uh, our memory traces shown with uh, solid lines here indicating strong memory traces. They've been linked together so the appearance of something can be li linked with the what that thing sounds like or the sound of the word and what it feels like and so on. And we start to build the concept of the thing that we just learned about. So now we've got strong uh, memory traces both in the hippocampus and in the cortex. Now, when we have strong memory traces in the cortex, they can be retrieved through other frontal cortex retrieval systems. And the hippocampus is no longer needed to retrieve that information. And this then explains why patients like HM had access to remote semantic memories. HM could, had general information about the world that he had learned a long time ago, and that's because his brain already did system consolidation and uh, filled his semantic memory with lots of information about the world. So when surgeons came along later and took out his hippocampus, he was still able to retrieve this information. But with that, without a hippocampus, you cannot make new episodic memories, and because episodic memories provide the content to semantic memories, you can't make any new semantic memories as well. Now, as it turns out, we'll see in a future lesson, there are good reasons why the brain does this system consolidation, why it is that the cortical memory traces must be strengthened, and that is because there are changes happening in the hippocampus itself. There are various forces at play that are going to be weakening and disrupting and interfering with the memory traces in the hippocampus, and so it makes sense for the brain then to store the memories, to store information in the long-term memory system that has a slower rate of decay. So to wrap up then, if we just ask the question, what is a memory? Well, let's go back to this picture here. This is right after the brain has learned something. Here we see the neurons that were activated and allocated in the cortex and the neurons activated and allocated in the hippocampus. So it's these neurons, then, that are, in a sense, going to represent the learned information. And as a result of that activity, they underwent plasticity, which meant those activated synapses on those allocated neurons got strengthened. And so when we retrieve a memory, we are simply reactivating all of that set of neurons that enjoyed that plasticity when that particular learning event happened and we're going to reactivate them and we retrieve the memory. So a memory then is in a sense a pattern of strengthened synapses among allocated neurons. The very neurons that were activated initially by the learning event and were assigned to make synaptic changes to store the memory for that event.